Not every day but once in a week Voices of Note get up and speak They tell stories These voices you know So listen up now Listen up to the show For voices that move And voices that shape uh, this is the show. This is my mixtape. Here on Radio Valley 99.9 FM, that is exactly the show that is airing right about now on a Friday evening. This is my mixtape. My name is Soup behind the controls, uh, NC, always uh, the, the, the board operator. And as always, I have to introduce my guest. Yeah, this is about that time in the show where I have to introduce the guest. Now, before I do so, um, for those of you who are watching on video, here's a clue. For those of you on radio, sorry, you don't get to see the clue. <laughs> All right. Okay. So w- what I'm doing is I'm holding in my hand a voluminous book uh, of about something like 700 pages. And, uh, well, I paid something like 700 bucks for this. So which means uh, each page is worth uh, a neutrum. <laughs> but what's contained in it is uh, far more valuable, I think, than, you know, just uh, a monetary amount. Uh I am glad to introduce the man behind this book, The History of Bhutan, um, Dr. Karma Pinso. Welcome to the show, La. Thank you. Um, again, I had told you just before the show when we had that little pre-chat, uh, Dr. In fact, when this show started about three years ago, uh, yours is one of the principal names uh, that we wanted to bring in. And my only excuse was, uh, or rather, the only thing that was holding me back was I wanted to finish this book. I really wanted to finish, the book, th- th- finish this book. But being the indisciplined uh, reader that I am, I never got around to actually uh, getting more than 100 pages, I think. Um, so, But then eventually I decided, no, you know, if we just keep waiting for me to finish this book, it's ne- never going to happen. So we let Let's just bring him in. Bring him in. And that's precisely what we've done. So, welcome to the show, Doctor. Um, obviously, you're a person who needs very little introduction. <laughs> yet, I know that the many of our young listeners out there may not know about you. Uh, so, I've given them a little context as you being uh, the writer of this, the history of Bhutan. But I don't want to slot you in as just a historian. Uh, you're far more than that. In fact, you describe yourself as, in your own words... Uh, what, what was it? Uh, scholar and uh, social worker. Scholar and social mm-hmm. worker. There you go. Scholar and social worker, and which is a kind of an understatement, actually, you know, uh, doctor, when we come to think about uh, what you do. Because when you just say scholar, I mean, there are many people out there who call themselves scholar, mm-hmm. but obviously n- not very many people have reached the level that you have or achieved what you have in many respects. You have broken new ground in many ways. Um one thing that I can say with certainty is that certainly now we have an objective voice that has that has now that is now telling us about our history, about who we are, um, and that is how I wanted to introduce you as as a person who probably understands better than most of us who we are mm. and what we are, where we've come from. Mm. Because that's what history does, Mushla. Mm. So um, nobody's gone to the extent to which you've gone in you know, compiling this book, for example. And I'm sure there's so many other scholarly works. In fact, you were telling me about a treatise you've been writing on, <coughs> on emptiness. <laughs> we're not going to discuss that here. Certainly not. <laughs> anyway, last but doctor, what's happening these days? What's mm. keeping you busy? Um, I've had a fairly busy and mobile life, traveling, uh, giving lectures and doing some social work, um, visiting friends. So I actually thought uh, it was my mobile and busy life that kept me away from uh, Radio Valley and this mixtape Ah, session. I didn't know it was uh, your uh, sort of uh, wish to finish the book. If I knew that, I would have actually turned down today's invitation and (laughs) made it a condition that you finish the book. book. Um, then we could have waited another three years. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be disappointing. I'm pretty sure so you can do better. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure. Um. So what I'm doing these days, um, I've just finished a, a long contract I had with the University of Virginia in the US Lass. as a researcher. Lass. So uh, ever since that contract ended, I have been in a kind of a professional limbo. Lass. But uh, what occupies me right now, I'm doing a lot of voluntary work for Lothian Foundation, which right. I started in mm-hmm. 1999, Lass. and I still help run with a very strong, good office team mm-hmm. uh, who do most of the work, and I just get to boss them around. But then, yes, yes exactly. <laughs> it, was your, it was your baby. We'll talk about uh, Lothian Foundation at greater um, length. Yes. Then, 
uh, this past week, you can see from my uh, forehead, which has been terribly sunburnt, uh, I was in my village. Uh, ah, I've been okay. going non-stop for the last 20 years to help uh, sustain and organize our village festival. Uh, because it's now a major calendar in the Bhutanese cultural uh, you know, sorry, major event, event in the Bhutanese in the cultural Lass. calendar. This and is the Ura. Yes, the Lass. Ura Yakshu. And we get something like... Uh, uh, 300 to 500 tourists wow. showing up at the festival every wow. year. Mm. So it has become a global event in a way. Right, right. Uh, whether we uh, project a good image of Bhutan and Ura mm. uh, during the Yakchu is really up to a lot of uh, people like myself who mm. are from that village and who have some exposure to deal with right. the outside world. So that's what I've been doing last week. Uh, and then um, I've also been busy building uh, some houses to create a uh, kind of a center for study and contemplation. Right. I, I like the sound of that. Study and contemplation. Um, what do you mean when you say study and contemplation? Uh, uh, um, one of the things that uh, I believe in uh, is the power of thinking. Right. Uh, we need to really think. Uh, as a capable person, as an effective person, it's a prerequisite that you have the capacity to think. Plus. A lot of our education uh, doesn't seem to promote that mm. uh, culture of thinking. Right, right, right. We take a lot of things for granted. Mm. We have the herd mentality. Mm. We uh, just go after whatever the, the trend and the fashion mm. and the crowd uh, is interested. I think we need to do a lot, lot more critical and independent thinking. Mm both in worldly affairs and also in spiritual pursuits. Last, last. Um, so this place is going to have a, a good Buddhist library okay. and also help people come and study Buddhism and related spiritual traditions. Plus uh, also modern contemporary uh, issues that we need to think about. So nice. sustainability, for instance. No? Okay. Um, so it's a place where I hope people will come and learn and study and think and then contemplate and reflect because that's the other thing. We need okay. to sometimes calm down, mm. uh, reflect, uh, make proper assessments of things. Mm. Um, so this really a, a way to build the capacity of uh, the people okay. to thinking and reflection. Last, last, last. So, uh, I mean, the way I see it, uh, very often some people will associate something like Buddhism or mm. Buddhist studies with something that uh, that's what my parents did. Mm. It's my mm. parents' generation. Getting, I'm not interested in it. Mm. How is it relevant to my life? Mm. So, in in many senses, you, you're making that yep. that. Uh, relevance. Yes. Last. So, uh, when people ask me what I'm doing. <laughs> I often try to, uh, without being pompous, I mm. try to say my modest role in, uh, in the uh, history of Bhutan or in our current uh, society is I try to reappropriate and reformulate our past to make them relevant for our future and the present. And I think there is a great uh, wealth in our past that we can use today to mm -hmm. encounter a lot of difficulties we face to uh, also make them relevant and useful for the future. Last, last, last. So basically when we talk about Buddhism, um, there are two ways you can look at it. There is the Buddhist heritage that has come to us in the form of religion and culture. Mm -hmm. And that's what our parents and grandparents have right. practiced. Right. Um, I'm not particularly so enthusiastic about the religion side. Mm. It's a bit like the Catholic Church in Europe. Right. right. Uh, sometimes people question whether they are Christian enough. Mm. Uh, in the same way, we could also talk about religious institutions here and mm. ask if they are really Buddhist enough. Right, right. Um, but then the true, the core message of Buddhism is mm. timeless. Nice. And that's relevant for anyone. Right. And I think our young people should also go for the Buddhist spirituality mm. that's based on those core timeless values and principles nice. rather than the, the outdated mm. cultural practices, rituals and right. routines. Right. And so it's important in that respect because... You know, you, I, everyone, all of us, we have a spiritual leading. Mm. There are spiritual needs we need to respond to, we need to answer. Everyone has these questions about our existence, mm. you know, the universe, mm -hmm. what is meaning in life, mm -hmm. what's the purpose of our ex uh, being here. These are big spiritual questions and you need some spiritual practice to... Mm. 
to feel at home to sort of resolve these uh, tensions and i think buddhism has a lot to offer does. as a spiritual tradition even does. if you don't take up buddhism mm. as a religion you know doctor i'm very pleased to hear that in fact uh, very happy to hear that because um i think you're one of those few people who has a very good grasp of you know ancient traditions uh, our cultural heritage and also a very good grasp of m- what the modern world offers and you you act almost as a bridge i think in in that sense and therefore for you to to bring up a center like that where you know people can relate that and as you said there's so much in buddhism that is you know timeless that's that's uh still relevant been and will always be relevant mm. uh, and i think it takes a person like you to actually you know help us the rest of us um understand that because yeah um as you said a lot of religious practice especially structured organized mm. religion it becomes ritualistic mm. and uh, superstitious as well mm. i mean like i'm told don't cut m- your nails after dark mm. and i want to cut my nails after dark <laughs> but uh, the, you know my parents have always told me don't cut your nails after dark i want to know why or mm. what mm. well, why shouldn't i cut my nails after mm. after dark mm. the, the lights now mm. uh, i have electricity so i might as well i have a nail cutter i might as well mm. cut my nails right now mm. uh, you know so that way and then yeah. what's the significance of having you know a monk come or a group of monks come to my house and go dung dung chang chang dung dung chang chang for two days and mm-hmm. then we call it a loche and whatever mm. I, I i don't get that really but things like you like you're saying and i don't want to discount our, our cultural mm-hmm. practices in any way but then like you're saying you know sometimes i need to ask my i do ask myself mm. you know what's the purpose of me having been born in the first place mm. why was i born into this planet mm. what, what am i supposed to do with this life mm. is it about making money is it about mm. making myself more relevant is it about empowering others is it about relating myself to you know well not just other fellow beings uh, fellow humans but other beings now these are the some questions that i often ask myself and mm. probably make my life more more meaningful i suppose mm. and mm. i look for those answers as well yeah no as sentient beings we all have that spiritual uh, side of us Lass. so i think spirituality is indispensable for anyone you could be a banker you could be a religious priest you could be anybody and i think there is the spiritual side we need to really um, cater to uh, and uh, if when we neglect that spiritual side in us that's when we get psychologically fragmented and disturbed and also um, uh, other symptoms in forms of social problems come out um, so that i strongly believe in uh, in sort of uh, having a system to help our uh, nourish our spiritual needs nas your side nas um with regard to the the cultural side now there are some things like uh, not cutting nails after dark mm. i think those are time bound culture bound mm. uh, beliefs nice. and you can let go some of those and i mm. don't think they'll have be any serious consequences whatsoever nice. uh, but then uh, your uh, take on loche mm. now that's a slightly more complex nice. uh, topic because uh, on a social level loche is when the family comes together true true so it's a very important uh, practice of social cohesion that i yeah. do so not so village lost. festivals loches and mm. many other communal events that we have across mm. the country they are put in place mainly for social uh, cohesion i to, have no problem to, with that like yeah, to mm. maintain social harmony so uh, that is the ultimate result you could say if okay. you can't it from a social point of view Plus. then to do that of course if you just tell people oh let's get together is very unlikely they would do mm. uh, so it's always good to use a a trick and okay. the trick especially for a pious society ah. you can always use faith and religion as a tool to bring <laughs> them together um, okay. now of course uh, if you do the loche properly Plus. you can transcend just the social in addition to the social okay. Uh, okay. benefit you can also get some true spiritual benefit because the okay. rituals that monks perform at the loches mm-hmm. are very rigorous meditative practices ah. if they are conducted as per the books as okay. per the theory last, but last. then we know not all priests are educated enough to understand the texts and not all mm. the rituals are done mm. in order to transform the inner state of the mind mm. there's a lot of external performances mm-hmm. and we sometimes lose sight of the original the actual purpose of the rituals you know, which is really transforming the state of the mind right so uh, our loche rituals i'm sure there are many priests who also perform it with good mm. dose of internal reflection and meditation plus but there are also many priests who won't be able to understand it and right. won't be able to perform it as per 
the the original sort of, uh, intention or the uh, theory last mm. last intriguing intriguing mm. in any case yeah. for us the, the common layman mm. it's it's still something i mean on a spiritual level mm. i i just don't see how it it, yeah. it relates to me but less, yeah. yes yeah. from that social angle that that you yeah. mentioned i i totally agree yeah. uh for communal cohesion mm. it is an important instrument yes. there, definitely yes, uh plus but uh Obviously this is my mixtape we need to get into your playlist as well mm-hmm. and uh, speaking of you know communal uh, cohesion mm-hmm. uh, we have the very first song is a raw field live recording mm-hmm. of of a song that is sung uh, specifically in your village of yes, ura indeed uh, it's mm-hmm. called om Om Chesela. Om Chesela. Okay. Yeah, so Om Chesela. It's a praise of Guru Rinpoche. Okay. That was sung in my village uh, with a very unique tune as well. Nas. And this continues to this day, uh, passed down orally from uh, older parents to younger generation. Okay. And uh, I grew up listening to this song. It Nas. is really a prayer that is sung with tunes. Oh, so okay. So the eulogy to Guru Rinpoche. Last, last. Oh, nice. So uh, it's <coughs> the equivalent of a, of a Christian hymn, I suppose. It's very much like that. It praises okay. Guru Rinpoche and it ends with the prayer that we be born in the presence of Guru Rinpoche. Ah. So um, uh, when you look at a community like my village, uh, you know, like the rest of Bhutan, they are very devout mm-hmm. uh, followers or uh, believers in Guru Rinpoche. Yes. And Guru Rinpoche has this f- amazingly powerful binding uh sort of force mm-hmm. to keep the community together mm. to give them a great deal of psychological comfort nice and then eventually of course also lead them to Uh, mm. enlightenment so this song is very much presential last thing last uh, i just wanted wanted to point out also that and these two places that we associate mostly with the guru mm. in bhutan are the tourism capitals of the country mm. <laughs> pumtang and paro mm. well uh, i mean we have to accept it because mm. uh, i mean these places according to bhutanese um, religious belief are said to be places Uh, through which you can get liberation Lass. merely upon seeing them right right visiting right. them right so right. why not share it with the rest of the world okay. and of course oh. uh, when it becomes highly touristic it is Lass. a bit annoying but then if uh, visiting kurji or taksang helps you connect to enlightenment and guru rinpoche mm. some way directly or indirectly why not encourage it why no, not allow I, it i was just it? i was just thinking about this thing the, the fact that the jumpel hanging and kishla hanging which is supposed to pin down mm. the, the left knee mm. and the left uh, uh, foot of the great mm. big demoness also these are in pumtang and and paro yes uh how strange is that we are coming up with the many parallels of course yeah. not, <laughs> nothing scholastic over there but it's just the yeah. weird random thoughts well uh, i'll give you a very quick uh, explanation to that pumtang Last. and paro probably were the most uh, vibrant uh, valleys mm. trade routes uh, that people used to go from tibet ah, to india ah yes yes so yes yes even, yes even yes. uh, I mean, when songsen gampo built these two temples mm. he had a good reason to build them in pumtang and paro okay and uh, when guru rinpoche visited of course he was also visiting mm. populated places right, where there were right, people right. where there were rulers based mm. so uh, i think kichu and jambala hang are in bumtang and taksang and kurji happens Plus. to be also in bumtang after right that. right right okay so that that puts it all into perspective mm. right so let's check out then uh, omche sela from uh, ura right. all the way from ura and please note you will hear other voices in the background but this it's, is a field recording yes it's recorded in the ura temple there you are All righty for those of you who tuned in late uh, let me just tell you that you're listening to my mixtape on Radio Valley 99.9 FM my guest here today is Dr Karma Pinto um right doctor now ordinarily this is the point where i would you know ask you about your life and your upbringing and all of that uh, i just want to push that to the side for for the moment um 
particularly because I want to draw upon your wisdom as a historian, um, especially after having read at least you know the the beginning of of your book, mm. <laughs> the first mm. hundred pages. Or so, uh, and I promise to you that I will finish mm. this. I definitely will finish it. Um, <laughs> I'll give you my word on that because I am interested. Actually, obviously, mm. I want to know more. Um, but you know, simple things like like. Uh, the name itself bhutan mm. Mm. um of course throughout history we have been known with with different names which all appear in your book like uh, mon lo uh, mm. lomon kaji menjong mm. drukyul mm. and then you have bhutan now and the most commonly used today is of course bhutan but that is a british legacy mushla mm. uh, yes i believe uh, uh, we'll have to accept that right right mm. and uh, the thing about it is that um especially what you've written in your book is that what we can see is that uh, there is a deliberate a- attempt to be objective mm. in this book extremely objective scholarly you know mm. uh, because i remember 25 years ago uh, preparing for the rcse examinations reading about bhutan history <coughs> mm. i'd read uh, some of the texts that you know the school textbooks then mm. I, i read uh, some of the texts like like uh, bikramajit hasrat um and a lot of it was just you know prescriptive stuff which mm. just gave you the information almost as if it was dogma that mm. you couldn't question it and here it was and this is what happened mm. and whether it was um slightly um magical or mythical mm. Mm. you couldn't question it because that's just that's mm. just what the text said whereas in your book you you mm. ascribe information mm. to mm. whatever sources it was mm. or or whatever mm. um just briefly tell us about this this approach why mm. Yeah um I am a, an academic you know? and as an academic we have uh, our ethics and our obligation to be as objective and as uh, honest as we sh- can be so uh, my history I would say is pretty much based on uh, objectivity that I could uh, afford uh, that I know is uh, as far as I can be uh, now in terms of how you report things uh, there's a simple academic way of writing nice. called academic hedging mm. uh, i don't have to claim that gurumpuchi came flying on a tigress to taksang mm-hmm. but what i can do is i can say tradition believes that mm. he came flying on a tigress or go. this text says that mm. and this that text says that so um that is how an academic would approach basically um reporting things mm. instead of necessarily prescribing to that idea oneself now i may in my personal life ascribe to prescribe to a lot of these beliefs mm-hmm. but uh, as an academic i try to take a distance and right. uh, treat the topics more objectively mm. in an academic fashion using modern historiographical uh, methodology nice so a lot of what you see here is very much a n- neutral narrative mm mm-hmm. and some analysis right now even when you have to deal with topics like gurumpuche uh, flying on a tigress or say kikaratwe coming on a wooden plane mm. or uh, say the topic of uh, gurumpuche living for many centuries mm. i certainly don't dismiss them as pure myth or fiction thus because uh, I as an individual I know very little about life and existence there's so mm. much that we don't know right right um so uh, one have to sort of accept that there is a great deal that we don't know and that certain miracles and mysteries may be possible mm-hmm. there's no way we can dismiss them as mm. pure fiction mm-hmm. so what I do is I place a lot of these uh what we may call myths and uh, we may call magical elements mm. in the right cultural context right right why did for instance the buddhist scholars uh see gurumpuche living for many centuries when it was you no know, from a pure humanistic point of view not possible for a human body to to mm. endure that long but then they also saw time as a very collapsible as an illusory thing you can mm. expand time you can uh, wow. sort of shorten time mm. and i think modern quantum physics also mm. is going in that direction basically right, right, to right. prove mm. the uh, non substantial the if you use the buddhist term the empty nature of things mm. so time space are all seen as uh, sort of illusory conventions and that there are ways especially when you use the power of meditation 
and harness the mm-hmm. inner potential of the mind you can transcend the uh, ordinary sort of restrictions and constraints that we normally face Lass, so that's Lass. the belief Lass. that you can leave a footprint on the rock if you have fully harness the power of your mind inside right 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 yeah. so i cannot dismiss these as total fiction and mm-hmm. uh, myths but what i do is i explain them in the cultural context mm-hmm. but again there's no way i can confirm mm-hmm. that gurumbushi came flying on a tiger stone right, right. so it's more of a you no know, a narrative and analytical approach that i take and try to give a story uh, that is presented in bhutanese history but also explain mm. why the putin is believed in certain things last last which makes a whole lot of sense i mean that I, the way i see it at mm. least is that's how a history mm. book should read i mean when a history book tells you uh, you're in class 4 or whatever mm. it is and your history book tells you guru much came uh, to taksang on the back of a flying tigress i don't know if that belongs in in uh, a theological text mm. or you know in your uh divinity classes or it belongs in a history book mm. uh for me I've, i've always had a problem with that and i'm not saying what i think is right and that mm. thing should be exactly my way but the way i see it is yeah i mean you need to have an objective voice mm. I, uh, mm. always you know um and it's hard and it's difficult for for somebody of my upbringing at least mm. to to swallow that uh, mm. as a textbook mm. uh so that was my problem with it but yeah i totally agree with you doctor there's so much out there that uh mm. i also have that reverence that you know it is centuries of wisdom they are masters who were schooled in these sciences mm. and had taken it to different mm. levels mm. and they lived at a level that i can't even imagine mm. so there are many things that that i'm prepared to to actually mm. digest and mm. and ingest as well mm. um uh simply because of the fact that you mm. know it does make sense in in mm. some sort of way mm. uh if you really yeah. break it down uh, i mean one thing we need to be careful is also that uh i mean what we don't know is infinite right so there is certainly a great deal of modesty one needs to have mm-hmm. but uh, that's not to again condone and sanction everything that is out there mm. and uh, through that also promote some kind of blind faith right, right not right. to tell people to take everything mm. and accept i think people should question and yes. sh- people should be critical which is what the buddha yeah exactly advice yeah. anyway but uh, unless there is good proof and evidence mm. to convince uh, one shouldn't reach any conclusions mm. either arguing that things ah. exist or things don't exist and i think uh, the university is so vast so mysterious it's unfolding I mean, there's so much that we can discover and i think it's at the best we can be very open mm. to new knowledge new information new discoveries and at least at the worst we have to try to be sort of agnostic okay. instead of totally cynical or mm-hmm. not dismissive or on the other hand mm. going fully on with blind faith accepting mm. everything not right, the right so in the end the middle path the middle path <laughs> the openness <laughs> yes. uh, the curiosity right. now we really need to have very uh, open minded uh, approach powered by curiosity mm. and only then you discover and learn new things Lass. i think uh, uh, sometimes i wonder if our fellow butinis have the power of curiosity right right we don't right. ask enough mm-hmm. questions we don't go looking for new information mm. or knowledge or wisdom mm. nice um you know uh, i was talking about the origin of the word uh, bhutan itself uh, mm. a while ago um a question that i wanted to ask you is because i haven't you know gotten to the point of of, of, of the jabdong what, what what i mean bhutan as a concept as, as a mm. nation mm. didn't exist until the 17th century when mm. you know the jabdong mm. came and unified mm. uh, the different uh, mm. tribes or whatever it was um what do you think they might have called bhutan mm. at that time in the time of the jabdong mm. so uh, that's the paradox you know I mean, before Shabdrung, we shouldn't also assume there was Bhutan. Yes, exactly. Just so, the, the geographical exactly. area that made yeah. a Bhutan, right? Yeah. So, if you look at the geographic area, uh, there were all different valleys. Mm-hmm. People from Paro went m- much more frequently to Tibet in the north than mm. to Thimphu or mm. Bumdang. Mm-hmm. So, there was very little sort of uh, east to west movement among the Bhutanese valleys. Right, right. So, I believe most people have referred to uh, Paro as the as Paro region. Thimphu and Wang region, mm. Thet for Punakha region, mm. Bumdang would be Bumdang, Kurti would be Kurti. If you read uh, literature, say, from Pema Lingpa's time, it's really uh, talking about individual valleys and areas rather than a homogeneous, you know, a, a bigger sort of uh, area called Bhutan. Mm. But 
um, then uh, as we start the the process of unification and when especially the northern uh, northern neighbors the mm. tibetans refer to the regions to the south they refer to us as lo oh, the Nos. south right and because the literary and the scholarly world was pretty much based on the tibetan uh mm, tradition yeah yeah so it was a tibeto centric scholarly mm. world uh, they used the same terminology so mm. when butinis talked about uh, the butinis region at mm. that time the they would say so yeah oh no. right yeah. or in in some cases lokashi lokashi so by the time shabdung uh, came to bhutan uh, the valleys here were referred to as lokashi okay but then we again don't know uh, what the extent of that lokashi is originally mm. lokashi was more in paro then it extended eastward going all the way to uh, sha region uh, before shabdung it's most likely that lokashi only extended towards uh, what we know as eastern bhutan today okay. only after shabdung's arrival right so right. lok was a very sort of a, a vague general term used Mm. by the tibetans to refer to uh, the territory south of tibet last 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 mm. otherwise uh, you've also put forward the the idea in your book that um the european usage of uh, uh, the word potente mm. Uh, mm. to refer to you know this side mm. of the world mm. may have been mm. um the origin of the word bhutan mm. to some extent uh, yes i mean they are related mm. i mean the english word potente has a very different connotation right. but uh, i believe the the uh, western use of the term potente to refer to the himalayan region mm. which they did uh, is based on both okay both for tibet okay uh, or actually both referred to the highlands uh, in the past in distant past and then from that term both we mm. get uh tibet mm. which is a derivation of tobet nas and then we also have the term uh, botan coming nas. out of the term right. bot so potente must have also come out of the term both mm. but it's interesting mm. to note i mean like mm. for the rest of the world mm. uh, for all practical intents and purposes bhutan didn't exist they, they didn't even know that there was this the sovereign mm. region mm. that was quite distinct from yeah. from tibet mm. Uh, mm. Uh, just to the south of yeah. uh, uh, south of it yeah but uh, the, here's again no i would uh, want the listeners to not to sort of impose our mindset and our thinking on okay. to say four centuries ago because Last. if four or five centuries ago how much cartography did we have there were right, no right. maps yes 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 the british to the south who mm. had just come to bengal didn't know anything about what existed mm. beyond the foothills uh, the same also applies to tibetans and chinese I mean, uh, f- forget about uh, gps we didn't even have mm. basic maps so mm-hmm. Uh, people might have traveled but how much uh, understanding of the the general area would they be able to get from just mm. walking through forests and over mountains and they did what they can at that time to right. actually survey the land and right. come with some kind of uh, mapping but mm. it is f- um, far 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 sort of uh, uh, poor than what we think or what we have to right do. true right true, so absolutely in their uh, time um we cannot expect them to have an understanding of mm. a nation state like bhutan right as bhutan was just a, a, a cluster of so many valley mm. uh, principalities mm. um and did, it didn't have any significant political role or um, uh, cultural religious role mm-hmm. to play uh, vis-a-vis its neighbors right right but if you look at india and china of course they have been uh, major players even mm. um, in the first millennium so. right right No, but then uh, again historically it, the one text that mentions clearly the use of the word bhutan was i mean this scotsman who mm, came and brought uh, yes, supposedly yes. brought t- potatoes to bhutan yes. uh, was the same george bogel right mm. uh, mentions the land of you know mm. the tibet and then then he re- mentions the land of deb the deb raja, raja is which bhutan. he later he mm. says mm. for convenience yeah. he calls it bhutan so, so until he came here in uh, 1775 or so th- right. the british to the south although they had all the advanced technology and knowledge at that time to come all the way from great britain to india and colonize it i mean they were quite mm. advanced but yet they had at that time no knowledge of what existed north of bengal mm. so it was bogal who discovered for the first time among the british that there are two independent states one right. to the north one closer to bengal to mm. the south and he decided to use the word tibet for the one in the north and bhutan for the one in the south and uh, terms like tibet bhutan potente 
these were all used invariably you know, in so many sorry variably Lust. not invariably variably uh, to refer to sort of rough spots in the himalayas rough rough yeah we've been known by so, so many different names. the two jesuit portuguese in, in fact call mm. us a uh, cambirasi cambirasi <laughs> cambirasi is it last last okay so uh, we don't actually know how they got that term last <laughs> okay uh, and they call tibet uh, poronke and at Lass. least that one we Uh, believe uh, they they went to the region of Porong mm. in southwestern Tibet okay. and they might have thought that, that ah. area is entire Tibet and used the name Porongke last last But okay Chambarasi or Kambarasi we don't know how they got that term right It's a mystery. Intriguing. <laughs> Almost as, as, as intriguing as, as the person who's sitting here in front of the microphone in the studio right now. We're going to find, <laughs> we're gonna find out more about him in just a while and find out his personal story yeah. uh, on the other side of uh, this small uh, song break where we're going to play uh, the second song on your playlist. That's uh, um, Tillemo's, uh, what's it, Bebo? Yes. So is, is this a Bira um, song? Th- this is a song... It's a uh, Shunda type song from Alas. Tongsa. It's a very uh, special local s- music from Tongsa. So very indigenous. Alas. And uh, I grew up listening to Amtilemo a lot. Uh, okay. She has this fantastic voice. And this recording was done in 1960s. So wow. it's one of the earliest recordings done of music Alas. in Bhutan. Alas. And I bumped into these uh, CDs um, on a in a book in a bookstore yes in a bookstore in paris wow so um that's why i wanted to play this it's a fantastic recording done during third king's time so you you've done some archaeological digging yourself <laughs> <laughs> well yes in if that can be considered archaeology <laughs> i have managed to get those uh, uh, cds thank you so much i mean this CDs. is this is this is uh, cultural wealth i mean yes, uh, yes. a lot of us have probably mm. lost contact with, with stuff like this mm. but you've unearthed this from from <laughs> somewhere in paris uh, imagine yeah, I I think they are on sale if you sort of google for them okay. or perhaps Lass. on Amazon but uh, I came across them in a big music store uh, on a street in Lass. Paris uh, with it among the world music Lars and we get to play it here on Radio Valley mm. yes thank you doctor let's let's check it out then I'm Telemos Bemo Uh, Radio Valley 99.9 FM uh, and the show that you're listening to is uh, my mixtape. I was tempted, Doctor, for those of you again who tuned in late, my guest here today is uh, the very well-known uh, social worker and uh, scholar, uh, Dr. Karma Pinto. I was tempted, Doctor, to listen to that in its uh, entirety. That is, mm. that is some really powerful stuff. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, she has this fantastic yes. beautiful voice. Wow. So soothing. I think when I was away from home, Uh, which was for a long period i mm. was uh, in india for 12 years and in the um, west for uh, uh, 14 years or so nice um this kind of music really gave me a lot of uh, comfort nice, nice. when i get homesick right and right. Uh, this is one of the or perhaps the earliest recording done in bhutan so yes it's a, a and cultural loss and to think that they could manage that sort of quality mm. in the recording in the 1960s wow mm. and, and in bhutan mm. is, is quite something mm. uh it's a very nice recording they've, they've used certain effects also like a little reverb mm. and all that also but you know fantastic stuff mm. lovely this is for me one of, by far one of the most uh, powerful pieces of Bhutanese mm. music if you can call it uh, mm. that I've heard in, in a long time well and glad to hear that uh, I've been working for last five years uh, recording Bhutanese oral traditions and nice. I think when you encounter pieces like this it really nice. sort of blows you away uh would you object to me pirating a copy of that um i think i think uh, the general sort of copyright uh, rules may not even apply now because Lass. it's more than 50 years in the right. uk uh, copyright is yes, yes, uh, it's 50 valid years. for 50 years yes. i don't know about bhutan Generally. or us hmm. so uh, i had the liberty to copy it myself uh, and share it here All with right. the studio so <laughs> i don't know if there are any legal consequences you will be blamed last last we'll take we'll take full full responsibility for that last all right so obviously now um 
like i said a while ago you are a person who strides these two worlds um you know the ancient wisdom the ancient cultural tradition as long uh, along with the, you know the modern uh, world out there the modern knowledge that we have scientific world out there uh, with equal ease um and i think a lot of that has lies in your life story you know uh, tell us about you uh, <laughs> doctor well, i i mean <laughs> um it's quite uncomfortable to talk about yourself <laughs> no but just uh, objectively again you're a yes. historian so, so let's let's have a history of your but, life <laughs> but i also don't want to bore people with just facts and figures um no, I, i was I, born in central last, bhutan in right. ura and uh, i come from a very devout religious family as most putinists do but mm. uh, i particularly come from a sort of a religious line mm-hmm. and then uh, i went to primary school there The most remarkable achievement I would say for my primary education is I went to class 3 3 times. 3 uh, times class 3. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I well, often say explain. this because yes. uh, uh, the first time I was in class 3 I uh, stood first and passed exams but I was too little for my parents to take me from Ura to Chakar. <laughs> so they went with some alcohol and eggs to beg the headmaster to keep me in the same school. <laughs> So I repeated okay. with my fellow uh, her, uh, repeaters, Lass. and uh, then <laughs> then they passed as well. So okay. there were six of us who got transferred to Jakar, and because they were uh, more company, then my father brought me on horseback and entrusted me, entrusted me to a lady in Jakar, and. Uh, Um I'm appalled by how the headmaster at that time treated us uh, retrospectively. Thus uh, we were asked to come to his office. Mm. And the fellow students who went with me they were a bit older than me Lass. and certainly taller. I was a small sort of ch- chubby little boy uh, who everybody bullied in a way. The teachers always uh, had me as a teacher's pet but Okay. Um most of my colleagues would uh, bully me. Um and they were asked to come in and I and few others were met to wait in the corridor and then they came out after a few minutes saying sir is telling us to go to class 3 i said why uh, we have finished class 3 mm. <laughs> in fact i finished it twice mm. <laughs> and they said oh uh, the headmaster asked them what's an essay and they didn't know what to say and the headmaster said you students from a remote school go to class 3 oh So Our I ended up again in class 3 that year. Wow. Um so on, I I had on the, the whims of one individual yeah. you had you yeah. lost the year again. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. So I had the honor of having uh, first prizes for 3 years in class 3. <laughs> 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 A record no one will break I suppose. <laughs> Uh, what, what yeah. was your final final percentage in in the final year? Must have been one hundred percent. I can't remember. <laughs> Obviously, what, yeah, right? But, we but, know, I, but one one very <laughs> funny incident I remember again. Oh, uh, how careless uh, one of the teachers was. Las. I think it was for geography. I scored hundred and ten out of hundred. <laughs> And you know how that could happen because uh, there were 11 questions okay. uh, that we uh, were asked to <laughs> sort of choose from. Right. I think I answered all th- 11 and Last. he gave marks for all and then added up and put 110 10 out of 100. Uh, out of 100. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as a little boy you didn't really notice anything. Uh, but, right, right. But when you look at it now uh, you you sort of discover how kind this teacher what a well, kind, a kind teacher. teacher or a careless teacher you could look at it <laughs> either way. Plus plus but uh, Uh, I did quite well in school um, mm. and there were some teachers who influenced me throughout my life uh, yes. especially after this headmaster the uh, headmaster I mentioned left as you can long children right right uh, okay she took the role of the headmistress okay uh, and uh, I uh, even today continue a very close uh, wow, friendship wow, with how her. fortunate and for you and she has mm. certainly influenced my life in big ways um I have had a very enjoyable school life uh, since then um being treated well by the teachers being good at studies and then i came to uh, tempo to yhs nice. for no good reason i was sent to jigmi sherabling after class 8 but mm, i calling. Right. was so stubborn mm. i went against my parents uncles uh, cousins uh, with no reason to come to tempo and mm. i found a way to get into young chimpo high school wow um and here too i had my share of bullying mm and the teacher who was teaching my favorite subject that was biology mm. i wanted to be a doctor no. i was uh, very good at biology i always no. scored above 90 but somehow the teacher totally destroyed my um my interest in biology thus no. and uh, so three months here uh, i had enough of yhs and i 
left it to become a monk okay. and at that time um his majesty the fourth king had the vision to have uh, monks uh, from students so to recruit monks from among students so right. i became one of the candidates and so went to cherry. cherry was it la yeah i went to cherry nice but the education in cherry was not satisfactory mm. uh, to at least me who mm. at that time was hungry for learning mm. so uh, i ran away literally I ran away from Jerry to go to India. I spent one year in Sera. This is a big Gelugpa center mm. where the main technique of education, the main method of parting education is debate. So okay. I learned how to debate. Last. Then I came back to um, Nyingma Monastery. So That's from Okaju you went to Gelug and yeah, then you went to, to Nyingma. Nyingma. Last. Okay. So uh, I started my Shedra training in what is known as Mysore Shedra here in Bhutan but uh, uh, down in India it's called Namdrilling Shedra okay. so I spent um nine years going through that rigorous program thus and i think that is one of the best educational experiences i had wow. in terms of the productivity of the time in terms of the rigor of uh, uh, the education so i really feel that i've used uh, my time so well in mm. those nine years and half way through my education there my master ben rampoche uh, he's passed away now but uh, he asked me to go and run in nanuri in dharamsala so i spent a year and a half running in nanuri in dharamsala right next to his holiness the dalai lama's residence uh, but i came back to do my exams so i completed my shedra training and then became a lopen lecturer in the shedra and that's when i again plotted to run away and to pursue a postgraduate degree in the west mm. um and that was actually Uh, inspired by what was happening here in Bhutan mm. um now our education system as we know has been doing very well in terms of numbers mm-hmm. in, in the 60s when i went to primary school i had to literally go to the village and uh, get the students from mm. the village to the school now parents were hiding them in the attic or in boxes mm-hmm. or under the stairs but in the 80s that changed and right. people wanted their children to go mm. to the best schools and uh, the school graduates like my brother they came out with good positions in the government with good uh, financial income mm. so what we had was this new bureaucracy the new administration with modern educated graduates mm. and i as a monk when i came to bhutan from india i uh, faced a lot of discrimination from the modern educated mm. uh, officials okay uh f- to them english was equivalent to education right. so mm. our culture our religious heritage was all seen as backward mm. and superstitious and even very wise old monks were treated rather uh contemptuously and i thought i really need to address this i am going to get a degree as good as theirs or okay. even better oh wow so that's what really forced me to apply to the west for a degree and okay. i was lucky to get a scholarship to go to oxford um oxford purely based i think their uh, uh, selection on my ilts uh, score okay and i used to do english after the normal shedra hours because in a shedra you're not allowed to read other books or right. read english particularly okay but uh, after doing the breaks and after the normal sort of shedra reading hours are over i would do my english exercises and one thing that i had was a dictionary that i took from urai school no jakar school um which i used to memorize one page day so wow. that's how i kept up my english and then um uh, when i did my lts uh, i was totally surprised myself i got to eat and wow. that was one thing that mm. uh, oxford could rely on okay the monastic certificates didn't mean anything to them because they right. didn't even know where these yes, places were yes. so with that i was uh, able to get admission and also a partial scholarship and yes. that's how i ended up in the uk uh, doing a postgraduate dr- degree first in a masters in sanskrit and indian religions then a, a dphil or a phd thesis on emptiness that you mentioned earlier mm-hmm. and when i finished my phd um or a good friend Francois Pomeray or Amtashwam who is a Bhutan specialist in Paris she offered me a job to come and do a postdoctoral research in Paris and while i was doing that Cambridge University offered me again a different job so i worked for Cambridge for 9 years as a, a researcher mm. and uh, my focus was mostly on Bhutan though right. it was around uh, the uh, turn of the century that i realized um 
that uh, Bhutan is one area which is not studied enough. Okay. That it's understudied and uncharted. Plus. Um, until then, I was working mostly on emptiness and Tibetan philosophers. Mm. My specialization was uh, on a Tibetan Buddhist master called Mipham Plus. from the 19th century. Okay. I worked on his philosophy and his writings. Plus. But uh, I realized at the beginning of the century that I'm in much more advantageous position to work on Bhutan mm. uh, because foreign researchers can't come here very easily. Right. Uh, and even if they got the political access uh, to get the linguistic and social access. Now, I, being born in central Bhutan, had uh, most of the major languages here. So, And, you, were, and you knew Chuk- Chuki as well. Yes, yeah, so I thought uh, I might as well work on Bhutan more. And so that's what I've been doing as an academic work for the past uh, 15 years or so. Nice. Working on our manuscripts in mm. the temples and uh, family archives here. Mm-hmm. We have digitized... Mm. When I say we, I and my team, we have mm. digitized over 4 million pages of wow. old manuscripts in Bhutan. Wow. And some of them I've used as source for my history. Thus. Um, but we have fabulous uh, heritage. Thus. Uh, written heritage. Thus. Beautiful manuscripts in the Thus. temples that uh, we visit. Most people don't notice them. Thus. Then uh, while I was doing that, I again came across uh, uh, village elders or monastic elders one particular incident, I was digitizing the collection in Hepu Monastery in Okay, Baro. okay. And I w- there was a heavy rain and the road has been washed away and I had to find some ponies to help me carry the equipment. And I was uh, waiting at the roadside when I saw a drunken uh, old man. <laughs> okay. And I, as you know, wear the bamboo hat. Right. He immediately picked on my bamboo hat. Uh, you know, bamboo hat being so popular, there's so many loses mm. around it. Okay. So he immediately sang, Okay. Shada kasha ki belo, nimsha se rangi belo be, chapcha se rogi belo me, chapcha se rogi belo be, nimsha se rangi 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 belo be, nimsha uh, extemporaneously as he nice. saw me with the bureau and I was captivated by it. I said uh, uh, no John Moore and mm. he said oh you have, you have to give me something mm. basically hinting that I have to buy him alcohol okay so I bought some beer and we spent the afternoon making him chant loses from Paro um, I didn't have a recorder with me ready then okay I used my mobile phone to record and anyway uh, that triggered me the that gave me the stimulus to think there is a lot in our oral heritage mm. that will die with people like him he go. probably is already dead mm. and the loze the tsangmo and whatever mm. cultural heritage he had must have gone with him no? so i thought we need to really do something uh, these things are more in danger than the books in the mountains in the temples and mm. the archives so uh, i found some grant again luckily in the uk to do a five-year project to go around the country and we, I had 13 people to help me. And so for the past five years, we have recorded many um, songs, stories, jokes, tongue twisters, curse words, uh, culinary mm. recipes. No, no, nice. Uh, so for animal husbandry knowledge, uh, mm-hmm. botanical knowledge, nice. farming knowledge, meteorological knowledge, nice. whatever it was passed down orally so far. And we have created over 3,000 hours of videos. Wow. And they will be soon published. Uh, Great. Uh, one by one, we have over 3,200 films. Mm. So one song would constitute one film mm. or a one, one folk story would constitute one film. Sometimes they are even a couple of days long, like a dance performed in Eastern Bhutan in Shingalauri it takes almost two days to finish the dance. Wow. Um, others, if it's a joke, it can be just a minute or two. Right, right. Yeah, so that's what we have been doing. Nice. And I thoroughly enjoy doing that uh, and also help me understand Bhutan's past much better. Because, okay. you know, if you look at our past, at the most 20% of the population before 1950s might have been literate. Mm. So if you rely on the written sources, it's only their perception that we are getting. Thus. Nice. Whereas the vast majority, some 80% or so, pass their values, hmm. knowledge, skills, practices orally. Right. So we had to rely on the oral sources to get a good grasp of mm-hmm. Bhutan's past. I, I so appreciate that, you know, mm. uh, Doctor, I so appreciate that. Because there are people like myself who, at a very young age, were sent to, you know, schools uh, outside of Bhutan. Mm. And... Um, well, not saying I'm unappreciative of that. I'm mm. extremely grateful for, for that as well. But we have that disconnect mm. with our own language, with mm. our own traditions. Mm. And uh, 
by all means again there are people out there whose lives span eras not just years mm. because mm. they've seen bhutan in the last 50 mm. or 60 years change dramatically mm. right from the middle ages into this modern mm. age of of uh, computers and uh, yeah. you know information and all of that yeah. the digital age um for so there's a lot out there that we have people like myself have this disconnect from and i'm thinking people younger than myself again mm. there will be so many also who mm. will mm. have that disconnect mm. who suffer that disconnect mm. and therefore for you to to be able mm. to to tap into that and and, and preserve it at mm. least you know mm. for 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 mm. posterity is is mm. extremely valuable i think mm. um and obviously it had to take somebody like you mm. to be able to do it um but i'm uh, optimistic in a way because um, we have gone through these learning curves um, where we have been fascinated by the new sort of modern mm. western uh, goods and ideas and practices but uh, we have also gone through the learning curve to come back to appreciate mm. our own heritage so uh, talking about um, the condescending attitude that some of the fresh graduates had in the mm. 1980s and 90s now with the rise of the dalai lama in the west and uh, followers such as richard gear and bob thurman mm. and many such mm. great figures following him and then these people looking for the place where the himalayan buddhist tradition was still intact mm. they came to bhutan mm. and obviously when richard gear comes to bhutan mm. even the modern educated you now western educated graduates notice him mm-hmm. and ask him why he has come mm-hmm. and i think it's partly because of the influence from the west that we have also had a resurgence of mm. interest in our own heritage <laughs> um, and it's ironical, a positive ironic ironical but, yes man. ironic but still positive yes yes and i think there's far more interest in buddhism since mm. then than there was in the 80s and the 90s right um, right and i think the same is also happening with regard to culture mm. that uh, truly uh, we have gone through this phase this romantic phase mm. with the new western modern mm. uh, a sort of era no both goods mm. and practices coming in but we have also started to see through some of those mm-hmm. f- sort of false hopes and expectations and right, ap- right. actually appreciate what is much more valuable to us and mm. deeply rooted here in our own world right um but i wouldn't just blame you uh, for having your education outside of bhutan mm. even the education we have here within bhutan mm. um, because it's primarily an ex- uh, an imported system, right, right, an right. exogenous mm. system which has not been properly adapted to the local cultural context a lot of children grow up uh, totally fragmented and disorganized and mm. confused now you have 8 hours of a day in the school classrooms uh, reading and listening and learning things pretty much like a child in delhi would do mm. or london would do or new york would do and then the rest of the time outside this school was living a different world again mm. so you're we are basically living two different worlds simultaneously right, right, and right, right. not everyone can cope with that okay okay in any case uh, doctor I, i i'm glad you shared that 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 story of yours mm. your own personal story also because that in itself has uh, shed so much light on mm. on the work that you do uh, and as compelling as that is i I have to take this another shot. Actually, we kind of run out of time, but no, I'm going to try and extend this as long as you have the time. Uh, Doctor, I'll beg you for a little more time. Is well, that okay? If we don't bore the audience. Uh, I, I think the audience <laughs> will be thoroughly enjoying this well, right now. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if, if uh, you want to tell us whether you like this or not, you can call in to 1-999 anytime, uh, people. What we're going to do is we're going to play uh, the third uh, song in uh, Doctor's playlist, which is uh, oh, Vivaldi, tra- classical. We have... Okay, the four seasons of uh, uh, Vivaldi. Lovely. So we have the spring, is it? Yes, I uh, think it's the spring. Right, right. Mm. Uh, and I think I'm kind of familiar with that actually. Mm. Um, right. So anyway, why why is this on your? Yeah. So I mean, I'm a very musical person. Uh, okay. Also a romantic person in a way. Um, yes. I used to be very much interested in singing and dancing and theatrical um, art uh, when I was young, especially during my school days. And when I stopped being a monk and uh, was in Oxford. I again have this openness to explore cultures and nice. uh, western classical music which is so big and so important in western high culture is something that the Bhutanese or the Asians in many uh, many parts of Asia they people don't appreciate. Nice. So I had to learn 
how to appreciate western classical music and vivaldi was the one that led me in ah okay it's fairly easy simple right, right, right. and mm. uh, my first exposure to vivaldi was uh, through michael aris okay when i asked him what mm. i could listen to so i can get you i can appreciate and mm. learn how to uh, sort of listen to classical music he gave me a cd okay of vivaldi so okay. so i i suppose this may be also a good entry point for other bootnews to appreciate classical music plus plus high western culture just a sheer curiosity totally unrelated to what mm. we were discussing also just because you mentioned my clares did you ever get to meet uh, ong sang suki i didn't meet her in person uh, michael and i we wanted to go to see her when he was ill plus so i definitely talked to her on the phone ah, but, okay. uh, we were not given the visa to visit her ah, and then he passed away okay and i made a pledge that i'll come and see her when the sun of freedom shines in burma um but then uh, things have taken a different turn so okay. i'm not s- so enthusiastic about going to my okay. marriage today last meeting her. last last <laughs> all right just out of curious let's check out this uh, vivaldi for a while and then uh, we'll come right back uh, and wind this all up Yeah here on uh, the final segment of uh, my mixtape uh, today's edition being with uh, Dr Karma Pinto the social worker and uh, historian and scholar right um the doctor i, w- I want to talk about other things such as you know the loden foundation which you founded in 1999 which is doing some fantastic work by the way and, and in an area that is again not something that we would normally associate with uh, with a person like you but yes we do um, <laughs> well uh, but um we just went through your personal journey and the, one of the things that that really strikes us is that you went through rigorous buddhist scholarly pursuits mm. right buddhist mm. studies um in the monastic tradition again mm. and yet you were able to you know then very easily move on to to oh, such grand names as cambridge and oxford and the university of virginia and all of that um and i asked you this question a while ago uh before the show you were asking well you did buddhist studies but you know you're still a layman and then mm-hmm. one of the things that really struck me right at, at that point was what you said you said it is better to to practice buddhist uh, buddhism as a layman mm. please elaborate <laughs> mm. um Uh, yeah well um i didn't really uh, get disrupted uh, the way many others do Ras. i think a lot of people give up um, their monastic celibacy because they have fallen in love or, mm. or have had an affair or something mm. like that um i made a deliberate choice to move from celibate monk to a, a lay person's life um one of the triggers for that was because i was one of the few english speaking monks in my monastery in south india mm-hmm. the monastic officials not my guru mm. uh, he was quite understanding and we had a very close relationship because i was interpreting for him Lass. in english Lass. but s- some other monastic officials had plans to send me to the us to run some dharma centers there okay whereas i had my plans to pursue my education okay uh, especially the postgraduate training in the uk last so the easiest way out was really to give back the vows ah and if you don't have the vows uh, our society even today thinks that only religious sort of monks and priests mm. can lead uh, centers and monasteries last last um so i sort of um change i gave back the vow and uh, started becoming being a lay person but the bigger reason i would say is more about my spiritual practice okay and the social uh, cause um i was already by the time i was going to oxford quite uh, well respected as mm. a teacher in the shedra interpreter for his holiness penorempoche and i had already a lot of monks and lay people studying under me mm. and uh, i could feel this sense of im- self importance mm. uh, of getting sort of stuck in a, a superficial artificial world of uh, 
being a special important person mm. and that would have been the biggest delusion for me to fight on my spiritual journey ah uh, so i thought i need to really break through that um and then um uh, i also felt that for spiritual training what you really need is the hardships the struggles to test yourself uh, i failed many times of course but one has to persevere and living an ordinary life is when you can practice now um, there's no point practicing tolerance and patience in a mm. hermitage for instance mm-hmm. where no one is going to annoy you right right but if you're here on the streets dealing with the ordinary problems of life mm. there's enough for you to to practice patience thus thus in the same way is practice of compassion now okay. stuck in a cave mm. you could pray for the ancient beings but that is not true compassion in a way okay uh, you are not challenged to really test your capacity for compassion thus. the way you are if you are on the streets here. okay okay um so that's one reason and then another very important point is also is some a mission that i haven't achieved mm-hmm. but it's important nonetheless is we outsource spirituality and religion to a professional group the monks and the priest right just as you said right. we call the monks to do the loche mm-hmm. once in a year and think we have done our buddhist practice mm. that is a total fallacy right it's so inappropriate mm. um you have to internalize your own spiritual mm. practice you have to practice the buddha's teachings yourself there's no mm. way you can have somebody do that practice for you and you get enlightenment and uh, there is a tendency in our society to make the religious professionals do religion and spirituality for you mm. what we need to be true buddhist is mm. to take the message of the buddha ourselves and practice it in our own individual lives mm. as lay people as doctors as engineers as um, media personnel whatever we do we should integrate the spiritual message in our own life last and last. not outsource it okay okay which you know again perfect perfectly because yeah. this that's perfect because i wanted to ask you this question right um precisely for this reason one incident uh, there was some uh, they call it chu or whatever it is uh, mm. multiple days they are taking mm. teachings from mm. uh, his holiness uh, this was in pinceling mm. um probably what six or seven years ago i can't remember exactly when but anyway so uh, i just happened to be in that area mm. uh, in the evening and obviously there's this old man who's been listening to the teachings all day long and he comes with his chain mushla mm. and then he sees a dog under <laughs> his car mm. he picks up this really big piece of river rock mm. hurls it at that dog obviously injuring it quite badly mm. and how do you explain that after a day of teaching mm. nola and the same thought went in my head that just because you attend a teaching and you not not mm. necessarily imbibe anything from it mm. just by attending it it's probably just a waste of your time isn't mm. it la mm. Yeah I, I mean if he acted the way he did mm. it's a waste of time because uh, the teachings should have at least made him uh, mindful of mm. his actions and then uh, the core message of the buddha is really non harming mm-hmm. you cannot claim to be a buddhist and at the same time deliberately intentionally harm someone so there's no way you can accommodate deliberate harming uh now again if you are mm. slapping a child to discipline the child mm. that's a different issue right, right, you are okay. doing it out of compassion but right. if you are really harming somebody out of aggression mm. and ill will mm. there is no room for that in the buddhist practice Lass. whatsoever plus so do you get the feeling that often for many of us over the years maybe it's because of of uh, religious dogma maybe it's mm. because of just social conditioning whatever it is that sometimes we are misled into believing that religion is you know you, you go do your prayers you mm. attend uh, some certain prayers you d- uh, do certain rituals mm. make certain offerings and then god will be good to mm. you or some you know some powers mm. up there will favor you so uh, will be favorable to you mm. do you get the sense that a lot of people are like that uh, yes a lot of people um there is a serious misunderstanding of mm. the buddhist uh, practice uh, to begin with so uh, buddhism is not a theistic religion so mm. there's no god out there to save you or help you no okay. you have to uh walk the path to enlightenment yourself so when people uh practice buddhism almost the same way a theistic person would be praying to god and relying on god 
um, it's a totally mistaken practice. Nice. And then also there's a great deal of uh, sort of escapist and materialistic uh, tendency. Mm-hmm. What I mean by escapist is some people think only going to the monasteries and hermitages is really mm-hmm. uh, practicing mm-hmm. Buddhism. Uh, they run away from from the problem and life instead of confronting life and problems and dealing with it and making nice. the society better. Then uh, the other problem is they think they earn merit for a good rebirth or mm. to get a, a sort of a uh, f- happy future. Mm. Buddhism is not about getting a happy future. It's about really changing the inner state of the mind, your outlook, your approach, your values and principles. So any circumstances you are in, you have a happy circumstance. So uh, it has to do with the inner transformation, not about accumulating some unseen merit which mm. will bring you good rebirth or wealth or long life. I have been saying that because that's what I feel. I have been saying that perhaps on the show and in my personal capacity also many times. But I know most people won't care about what I say because I don't <laughs> speak from a position of authority. Mm. Now here is somebody who has been there, mm. done that, done the studies in all the different fields and is now telling you the same thing. All right, so <laughs> now validation. Yeah. Validation <laughs> for what I've been saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I must also uh, explain though that uh, uh-huh. there are many uh, Buddhist based Plus. practices for accumulating wealth, for elongating life, mm. for uh, uh, cultivating charisma and uh, uh, majesty. So, uh, there are many of these practices used as a skill, full, uh, skillful method, you know, as a sort of a means to reach the final goal of enlightenment. Ah, okay. You know, but, but they shouldn't be taken in exactly. isolation. Yeah, All they right. are just steps. They are means Ross, to Ross, an end. Ross. But a lot of our people mistake it. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. I didn't know about that. That, that makes things clearer. Right, yeah. okay. Plus, ah, okay. I want to continue. <laughs> I, certainly, I feel like this is 10,000 things that we need to talk about still. Um, and if Ganchu was here, he would definitely say, we should talk about Loden Foundation, you know, <laughs> all of that. But yes. we seriously have run yes. out of time, Doctor. Yeah. And yeah. with due deference to you, yeah. uh, I will therefore, uh, however, um, press you for a final word. I know it's difficult now mm. with your experience. It's difficult to, to, to condense it all into something um, so elemental or fundamental. But is there something you would like to share with, you know, our Radio Valley listeners and followers mm. who, by the way, are all over the world these days. Mm. So, anything? Yeah. Well, nothing specific as such, but I think uh, uh, one thing that we perhaps can uh, um, do is really uh, find a very good balance between our past and the future Okay. That facing. Mm. That if we uh, lose the past and go headlong for the new future we are facing, uh, we'll probably be in a a uh, uh, s- serious sort of situation of mm. cultural uh, chaos and you know, tension and stress. So uh, it will be very uh, important for Bhutanese, I'm talking about the Bhutanese listeners here now, to uh, really have a good uh, sort of synergy of our past strengths and the future. Um, and uh, there is a great deal in the past spiritual heritage that one can integrate in the ordinary uh, life, so this is what I will t- uh, end with. And uh, uh, the Lodin Foundation is a small effort on the part of me and my colleagues, basically to do that to sort of bridge the past with the future, to bridge tradition with modernity, and build a uh, sustainable, uh, wholesome future for us. Right, right, um, and that's precisely why we we study history as well. In mm-hmm. fact, you've you've said it very well in your preface uh, to to the book, uh, uh, the history of Bhutan. Uh, you've said. Uh, from the, from a Buddhist perspective, the foremost project of human existence is self-development and edification. In order to improve the world, a country or community must start by improving oneself, something that can be effectively pursued only by first understanding oneself. We are products of a complex historical process, and history tells us who we are and why we are who we are. It reveals the roots of our perceptions, prejudices, outlooks and uh, parochialisms and helps us, helps us improve ourselves by learning from past mistakes and emulating past achievements. Our past ex- 
explains our present and informs and guides our future nobody could have said that better and i think you dr are that perfect person who <laughs> in a way in a way and i really i'm uh, i really mean this uh, sincerely uh, mm. who, uh, who is there as a beacon of light to to perhaps uh, if not lead the way at least give us a sense of 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 direction yeah, sure in that way. sense right yeah there you go there you <laughs> but go. i'll try to also walk the path but uh, i obviously think I'll certainly help show the way i think uh, dr i told you you know right in the beginning you were one of the foremost names that we had on this show to bring on to the show and in fact to some extent let me say honestly maybe i was a little intimidated on on trying to get you <laughs> here so yeah because I, i fear that you know it might get a little scholarly uh but again you know having spending this uh, this last one hour and 20 minutes <laughs> uh, uh, with you yes i am uh, totally convinced um as i have been Uh, f- from day one that that you certainly are one of those citizens in this place that the rest of us need to look up to and perhaps have the most to learn from and in that respect doctor you have my respects and always my best wishes yeah. uh, from Radio Valley all of us uh, over here and certainly on behalf of all my listeners thank you so much for coming here yes. onto the onto the show yeah. right uh, it's a wrap then on uh, uh, Radio Valley uh, 99.9 FM my mixtape at this we're going to leave you with the final number uh that doctor has chosen for his playlist uh, while he's here and this is uh, jalam jalam yaji the perhaps the most rickser of all the stuff that he's uh, uh decided to share with us uh and but this is yet the original the 1989 version uh jalam jalam yaji by tasho sharal handup and that's what we're going to leave you with right uh please remember the show is rebroadcast tomorrow and the after if you don't catch us uh on those shows you can always catch up on the soundcloud link on our radio valley facebook page or else you can wait for the youtube upload which will be done by the good folks at uh, lavanya as always thank you so much lavanya films uh, i know i give you extra work every time <laughs> right right but uh, yeah and meanwhile have a good weekend have a great weekend